Good evening, all. Welcome to iFocus Online, the 348 episode, 23rd in the Ocular Plasty module. Today we have with us Professor Richie Goel from GNNC, MAMC, New Delhi, to speak to us on primary and secondary NLD obstruction, external DCA surgery, and its complications. Dr. Richie Goel needs no introduction for her magnanimous personality that she is. However, for all our viewers across the globe. She completed her MS, DNB Ophthalmology, and holds a fellowship from the Royal College of Ophthalmologists. Presently, she is the director, professor, head of oculoplasty services at GNAC, MAMC, New Delhi, and is an examiner of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists, London. She is the author of Manual of Oculoplasty, Manual of SICS, and has more than 100 articles in journals, 43 book chapters and is a part of three AIOS CMEs, reviewer of prestigious journals like the OPRS, Orbit, EJO, the BMC, IJO, and Clinical Ophthalmology, to name a few. To her credit, she has Dr. V.P. Chadda Memorial University Gold Medal, Srimati Rukmani Gopalakrishnan Memorial Gold Medal uh, from the Delhi Universities, AIOS APOA Hunavar Award, AIOS IJO Silver Award, and the outstanding paper by the International College of Surgeons. Former AOS Joint Secretary, the Joint Treasurer, Member Scientific Committee, Member of the ARC, and Editor of the De Delhi Journal of Ophthalmology and the Tre Treasurer of Delhi Ophthalmic Society are the positions held by her in the past. She was a volunteer faculty at the or Orbis International, has performed multiple live surgeries of LPS resection, the lateral tarsal strip, emeth glaucoma valve, FACO, SICS, in national and international conferences. It's a pleasure to have you now here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure indeed to interact with all of you. I would uh, share my screen now. And uh, as uh, I would be dividing my talk into three parts, one is the, of course, the primary and the secondary NLDO, and I would be taking a separate subsection for acute dacryocystitis. And of course, the third part would be my external DCR and its complications. So uh, dacryocystitis is inflammation of the lacrimal sac, and this is uh, primarily due to obstruction within the nasolacrimal duct. Now, it can be classified as acute or chronic, congenital or acquired. The acquired obstructions, uh, acquired dacryocystitis can uh, further be classified as pando and saldo. The term pando, that is the primary acquired nasolacrimal duct obstruction. It was coined by Lindbergh and McConnick. And uh, they described NLD obstruction caused by inflammation, which they could not identify the cause and which eventually led to fibrosis of NLD and ultimately dacrocystitis. Later on, Bartley coined the term as secondary acquired lacrimal duct obstruction, where you could identify the pathologies which had led to the nasolacrimal duct obstruction. So the age group which in which we see, I'll be using the short term spando quite often now. So the common age group which we encounter is the fifth to sixth decade and the incidence being less at both the extremes of ages because of lesser secretion of tears. Now this is one of the st study where from India where they had shown that uh, they in their subset it the acquired decryocystitis the age group varied from uh, 44 plus minus 18.95 and in this the acute cases had a slightly younger age group vis-a-vis -vis the chronic now, the clinical pathological changes in NLDO in PANDO were uh, described by Lindbergh and uh, Combic. And uh, initially, there is an active inflammatory phase where there is a periductal edema in the nasolacrimal duct. And uh, at this stage, the epithelium is intact. There is a dense lymphocytic cellular infiltration. In the intermediate phase, now the integrity of the epithelium starts getting compromised. Focal areas of luminal obliteration start appearing with the fibrous tissue. And last is the fibrotic phase where the complete obliteration of the nasolacrimal duct lumen occurs. So it, and it indicates that if uh, intervention is done early, maybe we will not 
end up the patient into a dacrocystitis. Now, Sando as the secondary causes uh, can be multiple and um, all of us know that inflammation, which may be caused by granulomatosis with polyangitis, Steven Johnson syndrome, sarcoidosis, or any exogenous inflammation due to burns, allergy, radiotherapy, and pharmacotherapy, the topical drugs like anti-glucoma drugs, they are notorious for the proximal blocks. When I mean to say proximal block, I mean uh, the punctum and the canaliculus. But they have also been shown to cause naso nasolacrimal duct obstruction, spe especially a drug like oral S1, which is used for GI cancer. Then there can be infections like Staphylococcus epidermidis, Staphyloco Streptococcus pneumoniae, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Ectinomycosis israeli, and Haemophilus influenzae, to name a few. Then the neoplasm, which may either involve the nasolacrimal duct uh, directly, that is the, uh, like carcinomas like squamous cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma, and anoid cystic carcinoma, transition cell carcinomas, or other tumors like lymphomas, melanomas, and sarcomas. Or there could be a secondary spread from the basal cell carcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma of head and neck. Also, there can be metastatic spread from uterine cancers, colorectal carcinoma, lung cancers. And the most commonly encountered, which I think all of us keep facing day in and day out, is the post-traumatic NLDO. And this may occur following blunt trauma, which may be causing a nasoorbital ethmoidal fracture. Or it may be due to hydrogenic causes like endoscopic sinus surgery or craniomasio maxillofacial surgical procedures. Now, just look at this uh, image on the right side. You can see there is a huge mass sitting right in the area of the maxillary sinus. Also, it is involving the area where you expect the nasolacrimal duct to open. So, whenever you are uh, dealing with these patients, you must rule out any secondary cause before you label the patient as Pando. Now, although Pando is classically described as one where uh, the cause of inflammation is not known, our own Dr. Javed Ali has uh, just now published a very interesting paper where there ha he has proposed multiple etiologies which could have, which can lead to dacrocystitis and NLD obstruction. And these are the anatomical variations as uh, we know the nasolacrimal duct obstruction and pando, this is, it's more common in females. So the longer lacrimal canal, which is narrower and irregular and tortuous in females has been implicated. Then there are cavernous bodies which are present both in the lacrimal sac and in the NLD area, which are, and it is more concentrated in the nasolacrimal duct area. And these are controlled by the peripheral and autonomic system, nervous system, and any descending or ascending inflammation or neural dysregulation causes malfunction of these cavernous bodies resulting in numinal mucosal edema, stenosis, initially a temporary NLD obstruction and later on it can lead to fibrosis and pando. Then the uh, role of sinonasal factors is controversial. Hormonal factors like postmenopausal loss of prolactin receptors predisposed to NLDO. Also in tears, raised levels of cytokines like IL-6, CRP and these uh, other uh, Markers have been seen. Also, lacrimal drainage associated lymphoid tissue derangement has been implicated. Now, a very interesting concept of lacrimal has been described by Dr. Javed, and he has published multiple papers on this. And this is a collective microenvironment of the lacrimal drainage system, the microbes inhabiting the lacrimal sac, and their interaction with the host cellular processes. He has also described that there are certain bacteria and viruses which may be protective and some may be harmful. So whenever the balance is lost, then it leads to occurrence of inflammation. The lacrimal drainage surfactant protein loss of SPD and SPC could also predispose to microbial insults. Then there could be dysregulation of antimicrobial defenses, gast gastroesophageal reflux, genetic basis and cosmetic products like there was a paper which was published where uh, mask mascara has been implicated as the cause of NLDO. Now, whenever we are uh, working up a case of uh, uh, dacryosystitis, first thing is that we need to confirm that the, that the patient has NLDO. So, how do we confirm it? One is, of course, if the patient has a frank regurgitation or on pressure, 
over the lacrimal sac area. Then whether we, the patient has come in acute phase or the patient is in chronic phase, why it is important? Because our management is going to differ. Then the condition of the ocular surface, the patient may be having watering because of NLDO, the patient may also have concomitant ocular surface inflammation. That is, they may be uh, entropian, they may be the ocular surface uh, may not be healthy. And uh, sometimes, uh, again, another paper which is soon to be published, we have shown that a lot of these patients are have a concomitant occurrence of mebumin gland, gland dysfunction. So it's difficult to say whether the MGD causes dacrocystitis or dacryocystitis leads to MGD. But what we saw was that after doing a dacryocystitis DCR surgery, the MGD uh, symptoms got relieved. So also we need to check the condition of the puncta and the canaliculi. Sometimes patients come where you need to intubate and due to multiple uh, previous probing, the canaliculus may be damaged and you may not be able to actually... Uh, use a bicanalicular stent, then you have to think of alternatives. Then the presence of fistula. The patient may be having a long uh, course where there are multiple acute attacks and the patient may be having a pre-existing fistula. There may be scar marks and uh, any previous intervention like uh, it may be an incision and drainage which could have been performed leading to a lot of scarring. There could have been previous DCR surgery scars which you need to see because other, your landmarks may be changed, your sac may not be uh, large enough to make good flaps and other interventions may lead to <clears throat> nasal mucosal damage. So nasal examination is, is done not only to check the mucosal health because once you create an ostium, if your mucosa is not healthy, then in post-operative course, there may be increased fibrosis and the failure of your uh, <clears throat> this, uh, this ostium which you create. And also the presence of DNS because if Again, there is a uh, mild DNS or moderate DNS may not uh, bother you when, especially when you're doing an external DCR, but if it's a severe DNS and, or there is a prolip or any other nasal mass, which is sitting where you're going to create your, uh, uh, this, uh, this osteotomy, then again, the chances of post-operative failure are high. Also, many times patients with trauma, they may have uh, telecanthus, they may have orbital nasal fractures along with it. So if you have a patient with telecanthus, you need to address that as well in the same sitting. Also, if you have orbital or nasal fractures that need to be addressed, sometimes old fractures, they may heal and they your landmarks may be lost and you may not find the sutures for, uh, um, you know, where you really want to start your breaking your bone or nibbling. Or also sometimes uh, you may not find the sac where it is usually located. So you need to see that your uh, if there is any such uh, trauma earlier which has caused these displacements or different anatomy, you need to be um, you take precautions beforehand. Also, if it is a unilateral or bilateral, lots of times you may encounter patients where we have a bilateral dacryocystitis. So you need to rule out whether uh, the patient may actually sometimes may be suffering from diseases like tuberculosis where we, I, we have seen that uh, uh, the patient has presented with bilateral uh, chronic tacrocystitis and when we took a biopsy, it came out to be like we had a failed DCR and we could not understand the reason when we sent the second time when we did and we sent the biopsy, it, it came out to be a patient of tuberculosis. So you need to keep that in mind. And also not only that, whether you suppose it's a bilateral DCR, whether you want to go ahead and do it simultaneously, or you want to do a stage procedure, the patient may be present with sometimes with cataracts and the patient may be having a bilateral uh, 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 this thing, dacrocystitis. And you are, you cannot have waste so much time in, doing a stage procedure. So you may have to take a call that you want to go ahead and do a bilateral procedure. Also, there would be patients who are, would be old age patients. Sometimes they present with dacrocystitis with cataracts, which are, which are, you know, they're in a hypermature state and the patient is not able to tolerate DCR. You may have to take a call between DCT and DCR. So these are the things which you need to address. And um, this is just to show you a picture of uh, post-traumatic uh, NLD block and you can see there is a scar running over here there is a telecanthus and uh, when you uh, look at this area this is the area where we have we plan to create our osteotomy and you can see there is so much of overcrowding 
in the nasal cavity so you have to take your uh, ent uh, consultation and take them into loop before you start uh, proceeding for surgery in these kind of patients now the investigations uh, which are done or it will depend again whether you are planning the surgery under local anesthesia or general anesthesia again uh, external dcr in adults mostly we are doing under uh, local anesthesia but then there are uh, people who like to operate cases under general anesthesia children of course have to be done under general anesthesia or a patient who is uh, like sometimes we have patients who are not cooperative for whatever reason or would require monitoring because of systemic illnesses. So there you have to uh, investigate accordingly. Otherwise, the standard protocol is, of course, the hemogram, the blood sugars, the coagulation profile, and this is the tri dot for any viral antigens and antibody. Then depending on uh, what kind of patient, suppose you are suspecting an orbital mass or uh, sorry, a nasal mass, or you are suspecting some kind of a disease where you want to rule out uh, and you want to check the cavity or there is a trauma, then you would need to go in for uh, advanced, more investigations other than the above. So you may require imaging. And I think the a complete uh, class has been then there on these kind of so investigations. So I'll just skip it. Now, the success rates of external DCR are extremely good. Now, initial uh, reports, they show as 63%, but nowadays, all the in fact, 97 people have even reported 99 and 100%. So, the causes of failure in external DCR are, are mostly because of anatomical variations and intranasal pathologies. And uh, these, uh, the granulation tissue, formation of granulation tissue, scar formation, and the rhinostomy, sometimes if the size is inadequate, location is uh, incorrect, or there may be nasal polyps or rhinosinusitis, may, which may later on uh, lead to a lot of inflammation and scar formation and closure of the, osteo of the rhinostomy, which we have created. Then there could be inappropriate, uh, this way I've, I've already told, then there could be a pneumatization of the uh, concabulosa. There could be intranasal adhesion between uh, the whatever osteotomy you have created and along with that it there may be mucosal damage and that mucosa may go and stick on to the uh, osteotomy then uh, of course abnormal size of the fistula some syndrome a, a very uh, important uh, cause of failure is that suppose you create a very uh, highly uh, placed osteotomy and what happens is the lower part of the sac it becomes redundant and the fluid or whatever collection it starts accumulating in that, that itself can lead to uh, regurgitation, uh, positive on pressure, and that can lead to failure of your uh, surgery. Then previous maxillofacial trauma where uh, your anatomy again may be distorted. Enlargement of agar nasi cells, these are ethmoidal cells. Then um, there could be a hypertrophic middle turbinate. So these are some of the uh, causes implicated. Now, let us see how do, suppose you want to go in and do an external DCR, how do you anesthetize the patient? So, uh, the main supply which has to be uh, addressed is the nasociliary nerve. So, this, this is the area which is supplied by the ophthalmic. This is the maxillary. This is the fifth. These are the branches of the sensory supply of the fifth nerve and this is the mandibular. So, you can see this is the area where we are going to work and in this area where it is supplied by both the V1 and V2. So we have to address both these nerves uh, to make the patient comfortable. And the nasociliary nerve, as we all see, know, this is the superior orbital fissure and the nasociliary nerve, which is the second branch of the uh, <clears throat> uh, V1. So it, it is coming out through the central tendinous ring. And after it emerges, it uh, continues and... Uh, this is the infratrochlear nerve. So this is one of the branches. Then it goes and uh, this is the dorsal nasal nerve. Again, the branch of nasociliary nerve. The other is the maxillary nerve. As uh, I've told you, this is the maxillary nerve supply. And here what happens is the maxillary nerve, it is uh, supplying through the uh, infraorbital. Uh, this is the infraorbital nerve, this infraorbital foramen. So the other block that you have to give is here. Now, our sac is lying in the, this is a lacrimal fossa. This is the anterior lacrimal crest, the posterior lacrimal crest. And this is, after that, the nasal lacrimal duct, a bony canal. It continues the soft portion of the soft of the canal is slightly below the bony uh, canal. And uh, these are the blocks. We'll just see the video now.
So uh, this is the infratrochlear block. And this is the area where you give them. This is the infraorbital block. And then this is the superior punctum. So we dilate with the punctum dilator. Just check. So uh, th this is the anterior lacrimal crest. Now there are uh, two uh, places where you can give the incision. Either you can give this from the medial canthal ligament, just three millimeter from it, or you can go in and give it up about ten to eleven millimeter from the medial canthal area. Why? Because the angular vein is running at about eight millimeter from the medial canthal. So that is the reason. And this incision length varies in the external DCS from ten to fifteen millimeter. After that, this is the tenotomy uh, scissors and the orbicularis is separated. You reach the periosteum and then you incise the periosteum and separate the lac lacrimal sac from the lacrimal fossa bed. So this is the lacrimal fossa that you can see. And then, then the first thing is that you create a place where you want to put in your punch. So what you do is you break the suture between the frontus process of maxilla and the lacrimal and from there you start punching. So you can see that was done and this is the uh, bone punch. This is the anterior lacrimal crest that that is being uh, the bone is nibbled and you the anterior extension of this nibbling continues till you cannot separate the mucosa from the bone and the posterior extent is of course where the we fix the first pen and the inferior extent is till the nasolacrimal duct opening. So after that uh, what has been done is that you, I'll just, uh, okay, I'll just hold it here. So before you uh, go in and do this, uh, one way is that you address the sac first, the other is you address the mucosa first. So either of the things can be done. So this is a nasal mucosal flap opening that has been created. So this is a thick flap and already uh, this you can see here, this was the sac opening. So how do you make the sac opening? You first put a probe from the uh, canaliculus and as you tend the sac, you uh, make a incision which is all the way up till the fundus of the sac. So you, what you need to do is you need to open up the entire lacrimal sac. And to open up the entire lacrimal sac, what I like to do is I like to release the uh, crust of the medial canthal tendon which can be uh, sutured back after completion of your DCR. So they, that makes a very good exposure and your lacrimal sac, it opens up like a book. So that sac flap has been uh, raised and the posterior la lacrimal sac flap and the posterior mu nasal mucosal flap flap can be excised. Earlier on, we used to create H-shaped flaps and suture the anterior to anterior and the posterior to the posterior. But nowadays, studies have shown that it really does not matter whether you suture the posterior flaps. So most of the surgeons, they now only suture the anterior sac flaps. So this is the suturing of the anterior uh, mucosal and the anterior sac flap with a vicral suture. And uh, mind you, this again, this uh, if suppose you have a condition where... Uh, you are not able to create a sufficiently long, uh, like Ramus says, sometimes you have a fibrotic scar or you have to go in for re -DCRs. So you can create a slightly longer uh, nasal mucosal flap. And if it if the nasal mucosal flap is too long, or maybe sometimes there is a very large sac where there's a lot of redundant mucosa, then in that case, we need to trim the sac flap. But always, always remember that you must open up the entire sac. Sometimes what happens is if you don't re uh, release the medial canthal ligament, your fundus of the sac continues to be there. And what happens is you simply create a flap in this area, in the lower area and leave the fundus. So what happens is post-operatively, this again, this fundus of the sac, it acts as, a, uh, as an area of reservoir for the fluid to collect and you have a failure of the surgery. So you must open the entire sac flap and sometimes if you still feel that there is a, a little redundant, you can take a bite from the surface of this uh, anastomosis and anchor it to the orbicularis superiorly. So it doesn't fall and block your ostium. And then, of course, the incision should be closed in layers. And this is the medial canthal ligament again being put back into position. So this is important. And this is the closure of the skin and wound in layers. <clears throat> So uh, now coming to the stages of acute cystitis, I'll deal with uh, some of the complicated uh, cases of uh, DCR in my subsequent slides. 
so why it is important is like more many of our patients because of neglect and delay in treatment they would present with acute dacryosis status now this has been described in three stages and many of these studies have been done by uh, dr javed ali and they are very remarkable studies so i shall be sharing with you some of uh, the i have not written quoted him again and again but uh, it is assumed that most of the literature i think it's full of uh, dr javed's uh, research so this is a stage of cellulitis where there are signs of inflammation in the sac area and the patient uh, presents with fever malaise and epiphora then of course the formation of lacrimal abscess where there is a fluctuant swelling pus point and ultimately if nothing is done at that point the lacrimal abscess it kind of bursts open and it needs to find a place from where to discharge so this will be a fistula formation and the classically the fistula in this case would be below the medial palpebral ligament and you can see a picture over here where there is a large lacrimal abscess which you can see over here now the complications of course uh, would be acute con the patient may have a concomitant conjunctivitis there may be corneal abrasions also lid abscess osteomyelitis and even orbital cellulitis and rarely if the patient is still not taken care of the patient may end up with a cavernous sinus thrombosis and septicemia so the gravity of neglecting a case of dacryocystitis has to be conveyed to the patient also now the classical management of uh, patients with acute dacryocystitis uh, are of course antibiotics and i think all of us have been taught to prescribe um, um the, a combination of uh, amoxicillin with clavulanic acid and uh, the non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs in hot fermentation we did a study and we found that most of the patients which who presented with acute dacryocystitis 70% of them were resistant to actually this combination of drugs <clears throat> so what we uh, finally re recommended in our study was that all these patients where whenever they come present with acute acrystitis you should not uh, give a blanket treatment of this uh, group of antibiotics you must send the you initially you may start uh, with uh, amoxy with clavulanic acid but you must send a sample for culture and uh, you have to change your medicines accordingly now um, lack if the patient presents with lacrimal abscess formation then you have to uh, the lacrimal incision and drainage uh, was <clears throat> described followed by a dcr the problem with the performing an incision and drainage in these patients is it leaves a very ugly scar and it not only leaves an ugly scar sometimes even if there is no communication you create a condition and the patient may ultimately develop a fistula so uh, later on um, what was recommended was that after giving a, a course of antibiotics you uh, an external dcr should be performed but the problem was that uh, whenever you have these kind of patients they will you give them one course of uh, antibiotics you post them for surgery maybe after a week and since this basically the we are just decreasing the inflammation and we are uh, giving antibiotics but actual cause that is the stagnation of tears within the sac it continues to persist so what happens is that uh, the patient may again before you take go in for another surgery the patient may come back with another attack so many of these patients they come by, come back with recurrent acute attacks so uh, an endoscopic dcr uh, was uh, recommended by many study groups and it was shown that instead of going through a skin approach where you know making an incision in inflamed area can cause uh, formation of uh, not only scar but the uh, the infection may track into the tissues and cause orbital cellulitis and cellulitis later on so if an endoscopic approach is done in that case what you can get a early you can uh, manage these patients early and you get good results so um, this is uh, one of our patients where uh, this patient was diabetic and uh, again he had multiple attacks of acute dacryocystitis so what i did was i uh, did uh, i did a transclavicular laser dcr i'll just show you video how to treat these patients and uh, the advantage of doing a, a creating a small osteotomy in these kind of patients is that this osteotomy itself it acts as an ind without creating a complication on the skin <clears throat> so this is the dilatation of the uh, punctum and then the canalicus probe was passed and this is the diode laser transcanalicular 8 watt 
that it is used and you can create a bony osteotomy and it is very easy if if you have a large abscess you simply aspirate it first because otherwise you won't even get a place to pass your probe send it for culture and sensitivity and then you pass the probe and create a small osteotomy so we had divided into three groups where we created a small osteotomy and we did a staged uh, endos uh, endoscopic dcr in the next sitting after 10 days in the one group we did it in the same sitting the entire endoscopic dcr in the third group we created an osteotomy and did an external dcr after 10 days so what we found was that there was because of the small osteotomy, which was just 4 by 4 millimeter to begin with, the immediate resolution of uh, symptoms and the patient was very comfortable even on by day 3 of the treatment. So, this is the, after creating a small osteotomy with the laser, this is the enlargement of the osteotomy. This is the single stage which has been shown. It is done by Blake's list uh, forceps and you can see the problem in uh, acute cases is there's a lot of inflammation and because of that, the patient may, have, may not be very comfortable and you may have <clears throat> intraoperative bleeding. So, uh, this is just to show that uh, uh, all these patients where at least if you cannot do anything along with the antibiotics, if you create a small osteotomy with the laser itself, we did have an early resolution of all the symptoms. You can see multiple of these uh, patients and uh, this is a patient who had bilateral uh, dacryocystitis and, uh, you know, external DCR was done on one side. But by the time we thought of doing the DCR on the other side, she had developed uh, the, the sepsis. So, we went ahead and made a, we did a transclinical laser DCR and then we posted her for surgery the next stage in the, after 10 days. This is another interesting case where you, the patient presented with orbital cellulitis. So you can see there is a ptosis, there was a complete limitation of movements in of the right eye. And you can see there is this pus discharge from the lacrimal sac area. So in this kind of patient, you cannot go ahead and do uh, go for the surgery. So you have to first control the infection. So this pus was sent for uh, culture and sensitivity. She was started on IV antibiotics. After uh, about uh, six to seven days of IV antibiotics, she continued to have... Uh, the limitation of the uh, extraocular muscle movements. So what we did, what along with the IV antibiotics, we started her on a short course of steroids. And after that, her limitation of uh, movements uh, improved and also her inflammation decreased. You can see from this to this area. And after all the inflammation had decreased considerably, we went ahead and did a external DCR. So, sometimes you have to stage your procedures accordingly and uh, you should not be in a rush to, suppose you start, try and do a DCR in this case, you are likely to cause more complications. Now, this is another interesting patient uh, who was referred to me as acute dacryocystitis and uh, on doing syringing, I found that the actually the, the passage was completely patent and further asking uh, probing the patient in the sense ki, uh, since when it was happening and taking the complete details of the history, she did give a history of trauma with a wooden stick. So on exploring, during uh, surgical exploration, what I found was there was a wooden piece which was uh, embedded from the sac area right till the nasal cavity and that was the cause of these acute attacks. So always by looking just at the patient, you should not jump to conclusion and start. She had already received multiple courses of uh, IV antibiotics and all kinds of antibiotics and she was already planned for a dacro cyst uh, DCR surgery. So now uh, this is a patient with uh, uh, traumatic NLDO. Now, these patients, they differ in the sense your landmarks may be distorted. So, you must first check and you can see there is a large scar and uh, <clears throat> and the medial canthal ligament is uh, again not in position. You can see there is a large sac and this sac is completely adherent to the uh, lacrimal fossa. So, uh, you may not be able to reflect it all that easily. So, what we need to do is we need to open up the sac and create our flaps uh, in advance so that we have a good anterior flap. Now, this posterior flap has been excised. So, you can see the uh, lacrimal fossa bed has a lot of fibrosis and uh, this is the flap uh, being... Now, 
now i'll just hold it here so you see there is we cannot identify any area where we can put in our uh, uh, periosteal elevator or any any way where we, we can create a small osteotomy to start punching the bone and sipping the bone so what i did was because of the fracture and fibrosis what i did was this is a classical chisel and hammer which used to be used quite often in older days so you should always keep these things handy and this is what i did i created a osteotomy this is a chisel and this is the hammer being stuck and i created a ledge to uh, start my bone punch so after this you can use your uh, bone punch to enlarge your osteotomy as you usually do so thankfully the mucosa was intact and uh, this is a muscle hook being used to lift up lift up this flap and this flap is created and you, this is a posterior sac flap which is excised and you don't need to uh, intubate all these patients as we, we could see the canaliculus and rest of the area were pretty much okay. Now this is the telecanthus uh, being corrected. This is a proline suture which is passed from the periosteum and the medial canthal area so that uh, you can put uh, the medial canthus in position and uh, correct the telecanthus. And this is the suturing that is done in layers. Now, another way to create the osteotomy in these kind of patients is uh, this is a bar which we usually use for our decompression. So, I uh, we have just published this again. This you, It's a very easy technique. The same bar can be used to create the osteotomy. Again, these kind of patients where you you may not get a ledge or you can even directly use it. We have used it for doing performing this. It's a very fast procedure. Only thing you have to be careful that you don't uh, uh, injure your uh, soft tissues with this bar. So you have to make a slightly larger uh, external incision and you have to retract the soft tissues properly. And we have shown that even a, normally we use a osteotomy size of about 15 to 20 millimeter, millimeter. But here we showed that 8 by 8 millimeter osteotomy size also had good success rate and there were no failures because of the if it is correctly placed, it, it uh, does well. So this is uh, just to show how to create the flaps with the uh, bar in position. And uh, it's a, again, as I said, uh, no learning curve, just that you have to create the first osteotomy. Uh, the, you have to place it bang on the interior lacrimal crest because otherwise you do not have space to enlarge it. And this is the opening and you have slightly smaller flaps uh, with this kind of a procedure. Okay. Now, uh, this is another case where, again, post-traumatic, where you can see a medial canthal granuloma. So, here the we know that there will be some injury in the canaliculus also. So, what you need to do is you need to identify your canaliculus, place your probe so that you don't accidentally injure your canaliculus while you are performing your DCR. You, place, you can put in your stents there. This is, suppose you, you know here that your sac is not going to be a very uh, large one. So you can create slightly longer uh, nasal mucosal flaps and then you can anastomose. This is the intubation being done and you can just after passing you uh, the silicone stains, you can uh, just put in a artery forceps through the nose and bring it into the area and pull down these uh, silicone tubes or otherwise if you have the endoscope with you, you can endoscopically visualize and pull down the uh, intubation tubes. So either way, whatever suits you, you can do. And uh, these uh, are then tied into together in the nose. And uh, this is a flap. And it is, you can see a slightly longer flap has been created and in astomose with the lacrimal sac flap, whatever is uh, remaining is left. So, so now uh, coming to the complications of uh, external DCL, I will not be dealing uh, talking about the endoscopic DCL because uh, here I am told to speak only about external DCL. So as I said, uh, if you're doing it under general anesthesia, the complications may be related to GA itself. Then the local uh, anesthesia related complications could be accidental intravascular injection of anesthesia and uh, one has to be really careful while injecting. Otherwise, this accidental injection can cause dizziness, fainting, hypertension, bradycardia. Then because of lot of uh, uh, this thing, packing and uh, uh, this uh, nasal packing with adrenaline uh, soap, 
causes uh, you can induce arrhythmias uh, on table itself so one needs to do these procedures under uh, monitoring and uh, unfortunately i had recorded how to do a nasal uh, packing but i forgot to load it in my presentation so the nasal packing is of course the most important step in these uh, all the dcr procedures so just a word for it that uh, suppose you're doing the nasal packing you need to put 4% xylocaine and uh, uh, the two ampules of adren adrenaline, uh, the gauze soap, and the packing is done right up till, so that it's, it is it is in layers, right up till the nasal mucosa, so that you have uh, anesthetized as well as uh, uh, an avascular vascular area to operate, especially too when you're doing an endoscopic approach, but in external DCR also, you can go ahead and do a good packing. And uh, also during uh, making the osteotomy, it is uh, better to remove the nasal pack because what happens is that the pack may push the mucosa up. So if you remove the pack during that uh, stage, what you do is you, even if you accidentally create a small, uh, you know, you're not careful, your punch goes deep, you may save the mucosa from getting uh, any injury and uh, in the bar technique also what we saw was that if you don't remove the pack the chances of the bar injuring the mucosa were very high so if you remove the pack the nasal mucosa tends to fall back and the chances of injury are decreased and <clears throat> but the as i said because of uh, these uh, the adrenaline which is used and we also use nefazolin uh, soak sponges to uh, control the bleeding so that the area is uh, a little uh, the vascularity is decreased so all these things in uh, totality if you have a patient where already who is hypertensive and not well controlled so you may end up having a uh, rise of the blood pressure and pulse rate on table so you need to have a close monitoring uh, done in these patients and uh, so the intraoperative complications, I think the very uh, commonly encountered are the bleeding, which despite all your uh, efforts of uh, doing a good packing and keeping the head end of the table uh, on the a little on the higher side so that uh, the bleeding is decreased, we may end up injuring the angular vein sometimes on the first go only. So that is why it is important to place your incisions properly and the incision, as I've already told you, it should, the vein, usually the position would be somewhere around 8 millimeters. So either on this side or that side. Also, when you are dissecting the tissues, it should be parallel to the vein and not perpendicular to it. Again, that will help us in identifying the vein and not injuring it while dissecting, doing the blunt dissection. Uh, when you're creating the sac flap or mucosal flaps, Nasal mucosal damage, the initial punch, as I said, when you're doing that, you must, uh, especially for the beginners, when you're not sure about how much deep you're going, you must remove the nasal, uh, the nasal packing. Otherwise, once you get used to it, you can continue doing it and um, keep your, the punch has to be just below the uh, plane of the bone so, so that you don't injure the mucosa. And uh, the sac damage, of course, uh, may occur while we are cutting so again you you should try to open up the sac vertically that is from uh, the fundus of the sac to the bottom or the reverse but never perpendicular to it because again you may end up damaging the sac and uh, you should try and make a slightly larger anterior uh, flap so that because the posterior one has to be discarded so if you have an extra bit of it it's fine but you should try and cre create a larger anterior flap on either side then uh, in, in fact, most of the time, these patients, they uh, undergo multiple syringings and, and uh, probings. And sometimes, you know, if you are not careful with your, your uh, these uh, probes and also your syringing when you're doing, uh, instead of using uh, a blunt tipped cannula, you use uh, a lot of uh, people, uh, you know, they just use needles, they break it with the artery forces, they have serrated edges and they, they just poke it into the canaliculus and injure the, muco the mucosa of the canaliculus. So that has that's an absolute no-no. You should not do that. And um, again, uh, nowadays, instead of uh, using uh, bent cannulas, uh, my personal observation also has been there and, and Dr. Javed also advocates using straight cannula for... Uh, do performing these syringing and um, 
sometimes patient, if you lose the place uh, i have seen people uh, going deeper and deeper and actually going and cutting the septum also i have seen that happen so uh, one uh, needs to be careful and realize that if you have injured the nasal mucosa you just don't keep digging and going deeper into the nasal cavity if you have lost the nasal mucosa somewhere what you simply need to do is uh, nibble the bone uh, on the top a little more interiorly and try to catch hold of the mucosa which is usually hugging the bone and not deep into the cavity then suppose you go too posteriorly when when you're making the uh, the, the osteotomy and you go a little more posteriorly to the medial orbital uh, medial wall of the orbit you may end, end up uh, you know dislodging the infraorbital fat and this infraorbital fat actually may go in and plug your uh, osteotomy later so that has to be taken care of. Then, of course, uh, there could be a malposition of the wound edges. Suppose you have uh, created an incision during the surgery, you end up injuring, you, you pull it, and sometimes not only your uh, own fault, but the tissue may be friable due to multiple episodes of acute acrylic cystitis, and your uh, somehow your skin gets uh, in, uh, damaged, so, and you're not able to oppose the wound. Uh, then you may have uh, post-op wound diseases also later on. So these are uh, this is just one of the uh, you know studies I came across. This was possibly in the teaching hospital where a lot of trainees were uh, operating. So you can see the success rate even in this setup was about ninety point four percent, and they had uh, failures in nine point six percent, and the scar formation that is if you if you don't do a very meticulous suturing of your wound itself the skin enclosure that has to be done in layers you may have a very bad looking scar but if it's done properly the scar usually it disappears over the years and it's hardly visible so uh, again you can have a wound infection if uh, not taken care of and uh, granuloma formation and this is just to see a osteal scar uh, which can form in uh, due to maybe uh, you know, post-op inflammation or maybe uh, a damage to the nasal mucosa and sometimes you have a uh, sinicky formation between the nasal mucosa and the osteum or it's a small sometimes opening which can uh, fibrose and close. So now coming to the stent related complications. So the stent, it, whether to put the stent or not in a primary DCR, external DCR, uh, stenting may not be indicated in all the patients. Stenting can be done in patients where you expect some kind of a canalicular uh, problem, where some kind of a stenosis where you think that uh, the canalicular dilatation is required in the post-operative period. So these are some of the complications where if the problem with these stents is that it it's, itself invites a uh, deposition of a biofilm. You can So you can see this is a paper by... Uh, Again, digital, and you can see there is a formation of plaque on the surface of the stent, and uh, the stent itself can cause canaliculitis around it. And uh, sometimes the you know when you're you know, passing the stent, the stent itself can cause the punctal slitting. So uh, granuloma formation can also occur on uh, where you have placed the stent. So what uh, is be earlier on uh, people used to keep the stents for months together. Nowadays, the recommendation is that uh, you keep the stent only for four weeks, just sufficient for the epithelization to occur, and then you remove the stent after that. So this is another unique uh, complication of lag of thalmos, and uh, this uh, blink lag of thalmos, uh, this was studied, and usually uh, it improves over a period of three months. Why it occurs is it occurs due to damage to the peripheral nerves of the zygomatic and buccal branches of the fascia. So these nerves, they are traversing this area and accidentally the superficial branches, they may be injured when you're making an incision. So these uh, injury to these branches can lead to abnormal eyelid closure and lack of thalamus, which will be rarely seen, but you do come across such cases once in a while. Now in the pediatric cases, uh, the external DCR, this was another studies uh, where they showed that they had uh, studied patients varying from 2 to 10 years of age and they had subcutaneous emphysema in uh, some of these patients. And another unique uh, problem was agenesis of ipsilateral upper canine. So because possibly the canine root was over there, so the, the same area where the incision was made, so they had an agenesis later on. So 
the, oh, these children were less than three years of age where they developed uh, ipsilateral upper uh, canine agenesis. Now to conclude, uh, the pando that usually occurs in uh, females in fifth to sixth decade and uh, DCR definitely is the, defini uh, the main treatment for it. And if uh, delayed and uh, delayed, the treatment can uh, lead to a form of, uh, cause of acute acroacystitis, which again, if not treated in time, can lead to orbital sinulitis and even cavernous sinus thrombosis. The success rates of external DCR vary in published literature from 63 to 7, 97%. But as I said, nowadays with expertise being developing, many of us would have almost 100% success rates. Silicon intubation, again, uh, although uh, the endoscopic procedure, uh, especially uh, the powered endoscopic DCR, which is being performed, it is advocated that uh, even in Pando, silicon intubation and MMC is being used. But then again, there is a different school of thought with uh, different people. And in our study where we had used a laser DCR with augmented uh, surgical DCR, we had uh, shown that Intubation did not, uh, uh, you know, help in uh, improving the success rate in any way. Now, in external DCR, I think most of us would agree that uh, silicon intubation is not to be done in all the cases. Only in cases where there is concomitant canalicular obstructions and and all or patients which were otherwise anatomically successful but functionally unsuccessful, their silicon intubation may be done and. What it does is it, it enhances the lacrimal pump function by supporting the punctal opposition and also opposition during blinking. It also increases the lacrimal tear drainage by increasing the capillarity. But again, as I said, silicon intubation is a double-edged sword. So it, since it invites a lot of uh, accumulation of biofilm, it should be not kept for a period more than preferably removed by four weeks, if not more than six weeks. So um, complications, of course, the bleeding is the commonest and uh, then there could be damage to all the structures, the punctum, canaliculi, sac, nasal mucosal flaps. There could be post-operative wound infections or if improperly uh, sutured uh, uh, wound, it can lead to scar formations on the skin and uh, improperly placed or uh, small size osteotomies. These can lead to uh, closure of osteum psychiatrics there could be granuloma formation. Uh, superiorly placed osteotomy can cause some syndrome and these failures can also be attributed to incorrect uh, choice of patients and incorrectly performed surgery. Poor uh, post-operative uh, care of the patients in the sense that uh, patients where uh, you expect, like suppose you have a patient where you uh, you have some kind of nasal mucosa is not healthy, then maybe you have to go in and uh, uh, give the patient some post-op steroid, the nasal sprays, and you have to call the patient frequently to uh, do a nasal douching. So you every patient uh, differs and you have to manage the patient in totality. So I think that is all. Thank you so much. And I'll sh stop sharing my slides. Uh, Thank you okay. so much, ma'am, for uh, such a lucid, elaborate talk. We loved your presentations with videos as well, as always. Uh, Ma'am, we have a few questions coming in from the social media portals. With your kind permission, may we proceed with the questionnaire? Yeah, please. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, the first question for this evening is, what should be the ideal management protocol for a patient with 50% regurgitation of a clear fluid who on regurgitation of positive pressure over the lacrimal sac area is negative and who's also posted for cataract surgery in the near future. So if you, you mean to say it's an atonic sac, you say there is regurgitation or there's no regurgitation? There, there, is, reg is, there is regurgitation. Okay. So if there is a regurgitation, I would uh, like to go in for uh, first DCR. And then wait for four weeks and then plan a cataract surgery. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. If, if it's a hypermature cataract, then the earliest that I would operate is maybe... Two weeks, not uh, before that, okay. earliest. And if it is very urgent and it's an old patient, I may even go for DCT. If it's like it's a cataract or if the patient has already come in lens-induced glaucoma, I would rather go in and do a DCT and go in for cataract surgery. That's another way. 
Um, what if the other eye also shows features of regurgitation? Do we have to do a bilateral DCR and then only post for a cataract surgery? Yes, you should do a bilateral DCR. Okay. Until again, as I said, there are various scenarios where you, uh, you know, you have a situation where uh, the, the again the cataract is requiring an earlier attention. Then again, as I said, I have in patients, let's say seventy years plus seventy five, who cannot tolerate. If you suppose do a bilateral DCR, the you know, even if you're doing under GA, it's a lot of uh, discomfort, postoperative discomfort also for the patient. So here, where depending on the patient profile, then I we do sometimes go in and do a bilateral DCT, but otherwise never, never we don't go for DCT in, in, in any of these patients. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Ma'am, would you do the bilateral procedure simultaneously or in two stages? Like. Uh, see, external DCR, it has been shown that uh, you can do bilaterally and we I have done bilateral DCRs, but then if you have to do for a bilateral procedure, I would rather go for general anesthesia. It's, it's, it's very uncomfortable for the patient. Laser DCR, I have done under local uh, bilateral. Yeah, I have done that. Ma'am, uh, indications for mitomycin C in a case of an external DCR? Okay, now the question about mitomycin C and this silicon intubation, they're always controversial. So, uh, you know, as I said, I rarely use mitomycin in external DCR, almost rarely. But then if you have patients who have failed DCRs, then you know there's a lot of psychiatrization. You open up and see there is a lot of fibrosis. And you expect this fibrosis would occur even postoperatively or you have patients where your nasal mucosa is not healthy because of some you know Wegner's or any other atrophic rhinitis or whatever the cause may be there you expect that there's going to be a lot of postoperative inflammation a lot of fibrosis that was going to occur there I would use mitomycin see otherwise uh, primary no I would not all right I'm in the uh, uh, intraoperatively what is your uh, strategy in the management of posterior flaps? Okay. So, uh, see, the point is, as I said, uh, nowadays, none of us are uh, suturing the posterior flaps. And uh, even uh, the main idea is that these uh, anastomoses, whatever we create, that it should cover the osteotomy. So, to prevent uh, healing by secondary intention, that is the main uh, fundamental behind it. Now, uh, to create a, a large anterior flap, it is important that your uh, incision has to be in when, suppose you think about a flap, your, your, when you pass, what you usually do is you pass your probe and tent up the sac flap. Okay. So you need to pass it in such a way that you have an anterior two third and posterior one third of uh, tenting that is placed. And then you make the anterior flap so that you have at least anterior two-third of the lacrimal sac which is uh, intact and the posterior one-third you can sacrifice later so you make a vertical incision okay and then you make two horizontal small incisions so that you it, it the sac opens up and once the sac opens up the posterior sac flap is excised similarly when you're doing the nasal mucosal flap here where your canal you once you have uh, created your uh, opening for the lacrimal sac you, you or you have maybe you have done a tenting of the you know where your common canaliculus is so bank opposite you want to create your nasal mucosal flap so depending on that again you uh, you know raise the flap and again you uh, excise the posterior nasal mucosal flap so that is the way to go about yes ma'am what should be the ideal size of the osteotomy so as i said classically we all have been reading 15 by 20 millimeter should be the size. Then at least 10 to 15. Nowadays, uh, I think 10 to 15, most of us would agree. But as I said, we recently published this paper and we showed that uh, even 8 by 8 millimeter osteotomy works. So the idea came into picture when we published a paper in OPRS way back when we were using uh, laser DSCR with surgical augmentation where we had a uh, good success rate by eight, uh, with 8 by 8 millimeter osteotomies. So um, my uh, this thing idea was that if it can work in the uh, you know endoscopic procedure, why can't it work in the external DCR? So the same size we kind of uh, used in an external DCR and created the opening with a bar. And we found that it also worked. The only thing is it has to be 
correctly placed and your uh, mucosal plaques have to be correctly made but then uh, let's put it on an average i think we would all agree 10 to 15 mm should be the size okay ma'am uh, pertaining to the same uh, uh, instrumentation use like use of a burr while creating the osteotomy what if we as a novice if we drill through and then we extensively damage the nasal mucosa in that situation how do we proceed further okay so one is that how to prevent and then how to if you damage how to go about so don't worry uh, not only novice i also damaged it when i used the bar initially so uh, the mistake uh, which i was committing was that uh, you know when you're using a punch it's it's controlled in your hands so you know you don't have to go you won't go deep but when you're using a bar it suddenly just gives way so the trick was that you remove the nasal packing and then you do your barring and then also uh, once you may create a bar what happens is the last bit is you know almost like a thin film so i first i thought it's a nasal mucosa but actually the periosteum the last layer is almost like a thin film if you see the video um, it's already recorded there's a small thin film so that is the end point where you stop using your bar and then you remove those small pieces using a forceps now suppose you do have you have damaged your mucosa well whatever well with a bar or with a punch so the best is that uh, is, you now you have to you have suppose you want to create a, a nasal mucosal flap you use your punch now you don't use a bar at that time use a punch create a opening between your nasal uh, mucosa and your bone and you start nibbling forwards forwards anteriorly so ultimately there will be an area where you would have your uh, you know nasal mucosa which is intact and uh, especially with the bar you know uh, the size since the size of the osteotomy was just 8 mm so anyway there was a lo lot of area still intact where uh, we could uh, get the mucosa but sometimes when you're already planning and you have punched quite far anteriorly and there is no mucosa left then then there is a situation where sometimes the entire mucosa is lost there would be a situation so there was one study where actually uh, we studied the, these cases where both the sac and the uh, the nasal mucosal flaps were lost so simply like initially when toti described the procedure they he would they would create a uh, opening and they'll simply pass the intubation the silicon tube so even these patients they did well so this was another study which was conducted at a center so if nothing is left everything is damaged then also if you just uh, create the osteotomy and intubate it again it's not an ideal procedure as i said it's going to heal by secondary intention but at least do that much if nothing is left all right i'm in a situation where we say uh, there is a case of wegner's granulomatosis and then where you're expecting either a pre op or an intra op evaluation you see that there is a propensity for the nasal bridge to collapse or mm -hmm. you find an associated nasal mucosal pathology like polyps and all that and you have to address this epiphora issue where you are planning a dcr surgery then how do we proceed with such a case suppose you have identified then uh, I, i think it's best to take help of your ent colleagues and you should uh, first uh, prepare your uh, surgical field let's put it that way so if it is a polyp it needs to be addressed suppose the mucosa in, is unhealthy and then you may be by steroids or uh, you know you need to decongest and you may, may need to make things such the condition should be such that you should be able to operate and even in the post operative course after you have removed all this and the post operative course also frequent follow up with the uh, nasal douching and sometimes you know butyrosinate sprays are given so these things have to be additionally taken into account and uh, at times you may again still despite all your efforts you may still end up with uh, you know failures and you may have to go back and uh, explore your uh, you know osteotomy and enlarge it later on endoscopically if it is showing signs of closure so these things do happen despite all your measures all right ma'am ma'am uh, one more question coming in is uh... what is the ideal time to uh, remove the intubation tube uh, in uh, cases where we primarily intubate during the intraoperative uh, period okay so as i said uh, if you look up the literature the intubation used to be done for months months when i say months months means would be more than 6 months i have read articles where even for 9 months people used to do intubation 
so uh, people used to uh, um, believe that uh, the longer the intubation the, the better the chances but uh, dr javed has uh, shown by various studies that uh, basically the epithelialization it requires just four weeks so four weeks is sufficient for whatever epithelialization of the canaliculus or the passage has to take place and after that keeping the uh, intubation longer the silicon longer silicon material per se it invites collection of biofilm that is the bacteria and uh, the you know they it tends to grow over the top of the uh, silicon tube and there are uh, you know uh, even in our setup uh, in our uh, uh, center also we observe that if you keep so there are patients who would never come back for your uh, removal of silicon tube and uh, cre the patient may be doing well and after let's say they turn up after 6 months and the tube is still there there will be lot of granulation tissue formation along the tube and this would plug in and uh, close your osteotomy and this will lead to failure so four weeks remove the tube okay. ma'am in a case where we encounter a fistula then what is our uh, way of going ahead proceeding surgically as well as like in terms of its evaluation also surgery okay now uh, whenever you are seeing a even if in an adult patient when you see fistula first you need to uh, identify whether it is a acquired fistula or it's a congenital fistula there may be patients with congenital lacrimal cystitis or maybe with congenital fistulas who have been neglected and they turn up in the adult age group so uh, you know the location of the fistula usually it's if it's an acquired fistula it will be uh, situated where the most stagnant part of the sac is okay so it will be way down whereas a, a congenital fistula it will have a cleaner margin and there will be uh, hardly any inflammation around it and it will be somewhere around the canaliculus path a little superiorly located so one thing is that so now you have to see whether that fistula is associated with nldo or not suppose it's an acquired fistula mostly it will be uh, you know secondary to a nasolacrimal duct obstruction now the question is whether to deal with it or not to deal with it so again studies have shown that uh, if it is a fistula of shorter duration let us say less than 4 weeks then simply doing a dacrocystorhinostomy uh, once the passage is open the fistula tends to close up on its own right so especially when you're doing an endoscopic procedure there because you're not approaching anything from the skin side there you really have to take this into account whether to fiddle with it or not to fiddle with it but most of us when we are doing an external dcr what we tend to do is we create a incision in such a way that that fistula kind of comes within the uh, incision and you are able to excise it right now there will be a situation where you may have a fistula and yet you are uh, there is no nld so now you need to do a, just a fistulectomy so if you need to do a fistulectomy alone then classically earlier on we used to you know put in a probe and uh, we would uh, keeping the probe in there we would excise it with a the track the complete track and then remove it and then suture it and close it recently again there is a study i think you know, that has been uh, it's under publication or not i don't i'm not sure but i am sure the lvpi group they have shown that uh, the keeping a radio frequency tip inside the fistula track and endoscopically visualize it, it and you just simply touch it uh, with a cautery and what happens is that burn it closes the fistula and that can be done but as far as external dcr is concerned if it is the fistula is along with it most of us would actually excise it but uh, congenital fistulas as i said uh, would not close if just by dcr because the, those tracks they tend to remain the, the fistulectomy has to be done in those cases thank you so very much ma'am for uh, the time well spent and we got to gain a lot of uh, practical experiences from your end on this lecture today uh, i hope that all the post graduates who view this lecture at the end of the week Uh, get to learn both in terms of the theory as well as the practical guidelines while they begin to perform their DCR surgery soon in the residency as well. Uh, Ma'am, I just wanted to know one thing. Uh, before any of your external DCRs, do you routinely also look at the nasal cavity with an endoscope, or in specific cases only? See the uh, since I have endoscope, I do endoscopic DCR also. so i have it handy and i do look at it 
but yes at times you know it may not be 100 percent when ours being such a high volume center and so many things are happening at the same day on the same day so sometimes even if you miss it out then uh, just uh, uh, general examination you get away with it but if you're going and doing an endoscopic this year then you cannot afford to do that you have to you know inspect check your nasal cavity because if you have a dns as i said uh, even uh, high DNS actually, and you do an external DCR, you are able to do it. But if you have to do a perform an intubation, you're planning an intubation, and you have a DNS and or a polyp or any other uh, you know abnormality, then it becomes on table. You get into MS. So ideally, yes, you must inspect your uh, nasal cavity with an endoscope. If you can do it yourself, it is the best. If you cannot, please take help of your your ENT colleagues. Before we conclude for tonight, I have an announcement to make. The next session is on 27th of October as an international masterclass on endoscopic lacrimal procedures by Dr. Ronaldo M. Yavate. Thank you so much, ma'am.